Welcome to the third lecture uh, covering our second module. Um, we are going to continue talking about methods of proof. In the second module, we talked about the McDonnell Douglas Burdine uh, uh, back and forth process that happens, the, the prima facie case that the plaintiff produces when there's evidence, or at least the plaintiff believes there's evidence of disparate treatment, followed by the defendant's ability to uh, present um, a, a, an explanation that, uh, uh, that, that there isn't really discrimination, and then the opportunity of the plaintiff to rebut the defendant's case. So we've completed that discussion, and we're going to move on and talk about disparate impact and statistical cases. We did a little bit of this um, in the end of lecture number two, so I'm going to uh, uh, go forward to where we actually were. I mean, that is the Griggs case. The Griggs case, as you can see by the date, is pretty old. It was one, I guess it was the first uh, statistical case that we saw come down the pike. Remember that Title VII passed as a law in 1964, so this is only seven years after the creation of this law. And cases, when they begin, take a few years to go from discriminatory event, or at least alleged discriminatory event, to trial, to appeal, and then to the U.S. Supreme Court. So uh, this was probably a fact pattern that developed in the mid to late 1960s. And so that's where we are with this case. You don't need to know its facts for, the, well, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the facts, but we don't want to drill too much into the facts because the court really kind of moved beyond the facts of the case. The court had the opportunity to rule um, uh, narrowly or broadly in this case, and it chose to rule broadly. And the, what that means is the court, when the court rules narrowly, they're, they're saying, look, we're really just looking at this particular plaintiff and this particular defendant because there's some quirky, weird facts going on here. And so while we want to render a decision, we don't want uh, other people to think that this is likely to apply to their circumstances. And that's something that courts do. In fact, courts do routinely. Uh, courts probably do that more than the other, which is the broad ruling, although the U.S. Supreme Court probably tends to make more broad rulings than narrow ones, just because it's the highest court. The court that rules broadly is basically saying, look, let's not dive too deep into the particular facts of this case. We're going to not look at the minutiae. We're going to look broadly and say, generally speaking, what's going on here we want to address. And so we expect this ruling to apply to lots of different cases, even when some of the facts might be a little bit different. So that's what we have here, a broad ruling. This is a really, really important case, so let's unpack it. The issue, and again, we'll see the four things that we've seen previously when we're in analyzing cases, the four um, important uh, uh, categories that we want to look at when we look at cases. We want to find the issue. Um, we want to find the answer that the court gives to that issue, which is going to be the holding. We usually care about the facts, although occasionally, if the court is really broad, we may not care so much about the facts. And then uh, as a fourth item that may have some level of interest, we want to consider the procedural history. Okay, so what is the issue in Griggs? Did the employer's internal transfer policy violate Title VII when its standards were not related to job performance? In this particular case, the employer, Duke Power Company, passed over some employees and refused to consider them for transfers because they did not have a high school diploma. The idea was Duke said, hey, you know, you're not going to get to this particular level in the company until and unless you have the high school diploma. Well, at this time in the late 1960s, um, it, it, it uh, typically, or in this at least part of the country, African Americans were significantly less likely to have their high school diploma than Caucasian um, Americans were able to. So um, there was a very strong impact. If you required the high school diploma, certainly there were African Americans who had that credential, uh, but they might have only been 50 or 60 percent of the population, I'm making up numbers here, whereas perhaps there was a 70 or 80 percent of the uh, Caucasian population satisfied that requirement. Well, you can see that with that kind of threshold, you're going to find that many more Caucasians are eligible for the position and therefore are going to more likely to be successful. And so that is the, the issue. 
Now, of course, you could argue, well, in some positions, a high school diploma might be important or a college diploma or uh, some credential like that. It could directly affect the performance in the job. And that's, of course, the argument that Duke Power made. But um, there was a problem. And the problem was that Duke Power had not been consistent in how it handled this policy. For example, it didn't, while it required the African American employees to have this credential, this high school uh, diploma, it did not always require it for its Caucasian employees. And so I think that was probably a pretty important fact. And this is before I said, you know, I said before that the court could have ruled narrowly or could have ruled broadly. So the U.S. Supreme Court could have said, you know what, I mean, Duke Power is claiming they have this neutral policy, but it, they really don't because they don't follow it. They clearly are acting in a racially discriminatory manner by making African-Americans follow this policy, but not requiring Caucasians to follow this policy. So it's really a disparate treatment case. And we don't even have to worry about this whole disparate impact, statistical impact type of idea, because uh, there's disparate treatment. If we have disparate treatment, we're, we're good to go. We have all we need. But the court chose not to go the way. The court said, yeah, there's some evidence Duke really isn't having this neutral policy that they're uh, applying uh, it, to this to both groups in, in an equal way and in fact they weren't um, but we're going to act as if they were being neutral and we'll say well if even if that were the case even if Duke hadn't treated um, the uh, uh, African-American candidates in a discriminatory manner um, and had just applied this facially neutral policy how should we handle it in that circumstance so that's where we get to our holding and we have that while nothing in the Title VII precludes use of tests or measuring procedures, and of course, um, the, the requirement of a high school diploma would be a measuring procedure, what Congress has forbidden is giving these devices and mechanisms controlling force unless they are demonstrably a reasonable measure of job performance. So you have to prove it's a, the onus is on the employer to say, yes, we require a high school diploma and here's our evidence that it really is necessary, that it does impact job performance. Um, and so another aspect is, is that these tests must not measure the person for the job and must, must register the actual person for the job, not the person in the abstract. So you have to consider all of the circumstances that might have impacted this person. Imagine for a second that you had a candidate who was um, a more mature uh, person who had to drop out of um, uh, high uh, of high school in the during the Great Depression and let's assume that during that generation it was very very common for people to have to drop out to feed their families and it could be that this person went on and took uh, lots of uh, night courses or continuing education courses or perhaps this person had uh, learned on his own the, or her own the skills necessary uh, that that he or she would have otherwise learned in high school he or she doesn't have the piece of paper that says high school graduate, but he or she may well possess the skills that the high school graduate would have had. So the court is saying, well, we ought to look at the actual person. What skills does he or she have? Not what, uh, what, what this person in the abstract is about. And so that can make uh, requiring credentials like a diploma or a, a, um, a, a, uh, uh, a college degree or something uh, not as important. Uh, let's say that you are hiring for a position uh, uh, department manager and you require a high school diploma, excuse me, a college, college degree, but you don't have any specification of any particular courses, nor do you require any particular major. You have two candidates. Um, and let's say this company is, um, the, the line manager or line supervisor would be uh, supervising um, uh, engineers. And you have one, one candidate who does have a bachelor's degree in art history. Um, and then you have another candidate who has an engine or almost has an engineering degree, but is one course shy. Um, well, if you had a blanket policy that said, well, you need to have that um, degree in order for us to con consider you, then you would be leaving yourself only with the art history major. But I would suggest to you that the engineering major 
who is just one core shy, is probably the better fit. Maybe not, but but certainly it's. I think it would be worthy uh, investment of time to explore that person's candidacy. So if you had kind of an arbitrary hard and fast rule to distinguish between the individuals, that might not serve you well. And so you want to look at the actual person, not the theoretical person. Let's look at the Dothard case. This is an application of Griggs that came a little bit later. This is. Also an important case, people talk about it a lot, but probably not quite as much as Griggs. Um, but I, I like this case better in a way because the facts are a little bit more juicy. We can kind of do some more things with it. And I think this is a case that reasonable people might differ on. I mean, the, the, the Griggs case, eh, it's hard to make an argument for Duke Power because Duke Power wasn't consistent in how it applied its policies. But it's a lot easier to look upon the state of Alabama and say, yeah, we get where you're coming from. We understand what you're thinking about. And so it was kind of a, a more interesting a dynamic here. Well, anyway, in this case, Rollinson's a young woman. She's graduated from college with a criminal justice type degree. She's petite. She weighs under 120 pounds. Um, and she uh, wants to work as a guard in a prison. But she um, isn't even interviewed because she, the state of Alabama requires that um, candidates for their this position weigh at least 120 pounds. And so she is passed over for it. Um, she isn't given an interview. She isn't given any kind of skills test or anything along that, those, those, way, those uh, uh, requirements. So the issue that goes before the U.S. Supreme Court is may an employer screen applicants based upon their height and weight if those screens have a disparate impact upon women. Now, obviously, there would be very few adult men who weighed less than 120 pounds, um, uh, but there'd be a significant percentage of the uh, female population who would. Um, this this uh, standard could also potentially impact uh, minority groups who are perhaps of shorter statute or of uh, smaller size. So it's not just a gender issue, although probably it's most clearly uh, comes up in the gender context. So what the, what the Supreme Court said is, yes, sometimes height and weight really do make a difference and that you really have to be of a certain height for it all to be appropriate under the circumstances. But there's a pretty high bar for that employer to make and the, the bar is business necessity. Now we talked before about how you can't have a business necessity with a disparate treatment case. You can't ever say, well, I have a need to discriminate. No, I mean, there's the BFOQ, so I suppose in a, in a weird way you could call a BFOQ a bona fide occupational qualification as a business necessity to discriminate, but we just don't even want to go there. We don't like that terminology. It's just not, not appropriate. But when we're looking at disparate impact cases, because, of course, the, 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 the nerve of it is there's no intent to discriminate in these cases. Well, then the employer ought to be able to present a business necessity. My guess is when the state of Alabama developed this policy, it wasn't intending to discriminate against women. Um, it was trying to figure out now, I mean, what do we want our guards to be like? It may not have even occurred to the people that women would be applying for these particular jobs. Maybe they, it did occur to them, I'm not quite sure, but I don't necessarily know that they had any kind of discriminatory animus against women at the time. So, during the, the, uh, the progress of this case uh, through the litigation, uh, the issue of business necessity came up. And of course, the, the state of Alabama was saying, um, we need this particular policy, the 120 pounds weights, because it is a legitimate requirement for the job. And the points that they made were, um, well, gosh, if you're really, really small, you could be overpowered by prisoners and that could put you at jeopardy if you the guard are in jeopardy then and you're overpowered well then other prisoners could also be in jeopardy uh, whoever is the, the bad prisoner who is picking on the guard is now in control of the situation and that that bad prisoner may turn around and harm some other inmates also, it puts other guards in jeopardy because one guard who is in a weaker position um, might put the whole system because that other guard, that other inmate who's the bad inmate could now escape and could or could go into an area where he isn't expected to be and put other guards in jeopardy. Also, the guards that remain might need to go in and rescue the guard who has, has been injured or been overcome. 
So the idea was um, that they need to be of a certain physical uh, strength and physical presence to be successful in the guard position. Um, uh, and, and that, you know, has a certain logic to it. The problem is, though, that the state didn't ever do any tests. I mean, why is it 120 pounds and not 130 pounds or 110 pounds? Uh, maybe it would make sense to have a physical strength tests or physical endurance tests instead of a weight. I mean, you could be 120 pounds and be very fit and strong, or you could be or let's say you're 115 pounds, very fit and very strong, or you could be 125 pounds and very uh, uh, not muscular and not strong. Uh, it might be that the, the 115 pound person is a lot more intimidating and a lot more uh, safe for that environment than the 125 pound person. So um, Alabama really didn't go through those steps. I mean, it didn't know it was supposed to. After all, this was a, a first case. Um, and so uh, everyone was kind of learning from this what was necessary in disparate impact impact type cases. So the U.S. Supreme Court didn't close the door on this, didn't say you can't do this, but did say the onus is on the employer to prove that this standard, this facially neutral standard that does have a discriminatory impact, is actually a requirement for the position. And in this case, Alabama didn't make that proof, and so the, uh, the uh, Rollinson, Ms. Rollinson, actually won in this case. Let's talk about uh, the four-fifths rule. This is, um, I hate to make political or, or uh, personal perspectives, but I, I think that I am not unique in thinking this is a really bad test. Um, I don't even know why the EOC still has this test. It's been around for a really long time, and it's a really, really bad from a, uh, uh, a logic and a mathematical standpoint. Um, the test, let me, let me tell you what the rule is, and then I'll explain the problems with the rule. The, the rule basically is um, minorities must do at least 80, must do at least 80 percent as well as the majority on the screening device, whatever the screening device is, or the presumption of disparate impact arises. Well, this rule makes a lot of sense if we have a certain number of people in this particular pool. Let's say that you had uh, 50 people in this pool. And, or we'll, we'll say we had, um, let, let's say this population happened to be, uh, this goes sound weird to say, but 50% minority, 50% majority. Um, and so there were 50 minorities and 50 people who were in the majority group. We'll say African Americans and Caucasians, just to keep it relatively straightforward. So the screening device, whatever it is, the test, um, the physical endurance, thing, whatever the, the, it, the item might be, the, my, if the minorities do less well than 80%, compared to the Caucasians, then there's a presumption of disparate impact. But let's say instead there were only um, five applicants. Well, how do you even apply this test when you have so few? Because, I mean, you might just luck out and have really, really amazing minority candidates. Or you might have really, really bad luck and have really inferior minority candidates, and so it messes up the numbers. Even in the extreme, let's say we don't have 50 minority candidates, let's say we have 5,000 minority candidates. Well, you would need a number much, it could be much greater than 80 to be statistically significant. It could even be 95% at that level um, because of the 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 great numbers of people that you have eventually uh, the, the the sample size is huge in it when when a, an 80 percent difference becomes statistically significant but you know what the four fifths rule doesn't even talk about sample size now the EOC is obviously aware of this problem and so uh, they at either extreme they are suspicious of um of the application of this rule under these circumstances. So I wouldn't worry excessively about this, but um, especially if you are facing a disparate impact case and you have a, a fairly robust sample size, it, it probably does make sense to at least run the analysis to see which side of the four-fifths test you're on. And of course, four-fifths, by the way, is 80%, so it's just a different way of describing 80%.
Okay, um, let's do a little refresher on what the business necessity defense is. It's a defense to a disparate impact case based upon the employer's need for a policy um, or a device or a test um, as a legitimate requirement for the job. Is it legitimate? A lot of times we see business necessity uh, cases coming up when there's a public safety um, aspect. For example, um, some fire departments require that their candidates be of a certain height and the idea is that when you are going into a burning building you might have to uh, reach certain heights to rescue people or do other things that require a certain um, uh, either size or height to be successful at doing that. Um, again, this is something that is going to have to be proven by the fire department that wants to use that standard, but if they can prove it, then yeah. Even if it results in women being less likely to uh, pass that particular aspect of the test or even uh, minority groups who might not be at, uh, statistically as likely to be as tall as that particular level might be. Uh, so we see it in the safety area, but we can also see it with respect to education or skills-based testing. Um, you might be wondering here, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in a minute, but um, well, how do we, uh, how do we apply tests that um, an employer might want to develop to distinguish skill sets because it seems likely that there's going to be some statistical difference. The odds of the numbers being exactly the same across all the different groups just seems unlikely. And so where you see a difference, especially if you see a difference um, according to the four-fifths rule, would it be okay for the employer to have different cutoff levels? So let's say a passing test might be 87 for a Caucasian, but it's 84 for an African-American. So that means African-Americans who score 84, 85, or 86, they pass but Caucasians who, who score 84, 85, or 86 don't pass. And again, this could apply with gender and with religion. There's lots of different permutations to this. Well, there was some question mark about whether this would be lawful because again, you, it's hard to design a test that everybody's going to score equally well on and employers were concerned about this four-fifths rule. So they were worried about disparate impact from a testing tool that uh, causes there to be these differences. And so some, of, some employers were seriously considering and in fact had implemented different cutoff levels. But in 1991, the Congress passed a statute that said, uh-uh, can't do it. You cannot change the cutoff score based upon gender or race. You have to use those same scores. So that closed that issue for sure. So let's consider a couple of scenarios here. Okay, we have a law firm, Saeed and Rao, and it's looking for a qualified secretary. A criterion for selection is that the person type at least 65 words a minute. If a group of male applicants challenge this policy as being discriminatory against generally slower typing males, um, what do you think will happen? Well, let's assume that there are statistics out there that show um, male secretaries usually uh, average being able to type 60 words a minute, whereas female secretaries typically can type 70 words a minute on average. I'm making up numbers. I have no idea this would be true or not, but let's imagine it would be true. And then so you can see it definitely does have a disparate impact upon males. Um, but uh, I think there'd be a pretty good argument that typing speed in a, in a secretary, especially in a law office, is a really important factor. So I think that the company would be likely to be quite successful with that claim. Um, let's look at another one. We have an airline that flies very small aircraft. It advertises for flight attendants saying that they have to be between five foot and five eight without shoes due to the internal dimensions of our aircraft. Bob applies. He's significantly taller. He says that this rule has a disparate impact upon men and it does seem to have an Im disparate impact upon men because there's going to be many more men over five eight as the pop in the population than women. But probably because of the small size of the aircraft, uh, Polar Bear Airlines can probably justify the height requirement. So probably Polar Bear Airlines is going to be just fine. And of course, it helps Polar Bear Airlines that they don't have it be, let's say, 5'2". 
um, you know, if you if you were to carry it to an extreme, um, which obviously if you were to have the uh, the maximum height be five two, there'd be very few men who would be able to be eligible for that. And so I think the court would become more and more suspicious that this really isn't a business necessity, that it's really just a preference of this airline to have female flight attendants. Let's look at the next one. Okay, so Bob is a university graduate and he is not, ex not uh, offered a, um, a job because he failed to score high on a valid test. He takes the potential employer to court because um, uh, uh, he thinks that because he is uh, from Scotland, um, he ought to have a different cutoff level than other people. And he says, well, no one else of Scottish descent has ever achieved a satisfactory score on this test. Of course, you know, he's the only candidate ever who's taken the test. Um, the court absolutely is barred from giving Bob what he wants because, again, we talked before about this cutoff score difference is prohibited. So unfortunately for Bob, he is out of luck under those circumstances. So now we're gonna flip to an earlier slide. If you wanna pause me for a second and uh, flip through the section that you're interested in or that we're gonna be talking about, please do so. Okay, so here's another statistical case that we're gonna talk about. This is a school district case, uh, another big case, very common for people to hear about. In this case, um, there was a, um, a school district that had a low percentage of African-American students and a low percentage of African-American teachers. But the way the school districts were configured in this area, I think it was St. Louis, um, was that there was a neighboring school district that had just the reverse situation, a very high percentage of African-American um, instructors. And so the issue is, well, um, could uh, the school district be sued for um, having such a low percentage of African-American teachers because there seemed to be this pattern in practice um, and you could look at, at the fact that there was this neighboring school district that didn't have that same issue. So here is the issue. How should statistical evidence be used to prove a disparate treatment claim involving a pattern in practice? And so the court said the proper comparison in a disparate impact statistical proof case is one comparing the racial composition of the at issue job holders, so the people who um, already have a job, and the racial composition of the qualified population in the relevant labor market. So it wouldn't be how many African Americans live in this community, it would be how many African Americans who hold the required teaching credentials. Maybe it's a license to teach or whatever is required in this particular state. If the numbers are really out of whack, then that would be evidence that perhaps this employer is not uh, seriously uh, considering African American uh, teachers to the same extent that others that they are considering other candidates. Okay, here again, if you want to watch that OYA about uh, the OYA presentation, that then it would include the oral arguments that not sorry, not the oral arguments, the the case summary that would have been read at at in uh, at that year in 1976 from the, uh, the bench of the U.S. Supreme Court. Anyway, it's kind of an interesting thing to do. So we've now talked about disparate treatment and we've talked about disparate impact. We're ready for that third option. Right here, disparate treatment, disparate impact. Now we're ready to talk about mixed motives. And the big case in this area is Desert Palace versus Costa. Okay. So what is a mixed motive case? I mean, the name pretty much captures what it is. It means that the employer, when it made a, whatever the action is, obviously it's an adverse action, had legal reasons for doing it and not so legal reasons for doing it. And so how do you unpack that if you're the jury? How do you weigh, well, he had the, the, I, I get part of what they did, but there also seemed to be some other reason that they did. So the, the court gives instructions to the jury in true uh, mixed motive cases to help the jury decide how to weigh the evidence. So if an employer can show that it had a mixed motive for its employment decision, in other words, it had some kind of legitimate motive in addition to perhaps an illegitimate motive that the, of course, the plaintiff has drawn out. The, the employer bears the burden of showing that it, that 
the legitimate business reason was the true reason for its decision. You might call this a but for reason. Um, it it um, we, it, it um, would have made this decision even without the unlawful motivation, in other words. So let's look at the Desert Palace case. Again, this is a more recent case, we're in 2003. So our issue here, and you can see the same things, issue, fact, and holding, because we know the procedural history in this case. Can a worker use circumstantial evidence to prove the case is a mixed motives discrimination case? In this case, a female worker was alleging that she was subject to harassment at a casino, or at least a hotel, in uh, Las Vegas. And the US Supreme Court said, well, Yes, you can use circumstantial evidence in a mixed motives case. You don't have to have direct evidence. Again, little refreshers. Uh, circumstantial evidence would be stuff such as the prima facie case or uh, statistical evidence to, to indicate some, some circumstances. Now, since this is a harassment case, uh, you're, you're less likely to have statistical evidence. But you know, if you, if you let's say it was a, a, a sex discrimination case versus a harassment case, and you were able to show that there were you know, 100 women who applied for the job and 100 men who applied for the job, and there were 20 people hired and 19 of them were men, that's pretty, uh, uh, strong statistical evidence that perhaps there was some type of discrimination, assuming that all the candidates were, were reasonably qualified for the position. Um, but it doesn't prove that any particular person was excluded because of that. An example of direct evidence would be um, an interviewer saying, well, we don't really think a woman would be right for that job, or um, I don't really think women should be in the workforce, or something along those lines. That would be strong direct evidence. So in order to receive a mixed motive instruction from the judge that the jury would hear, the plaintiff need only present sufficient evidence for a jury to conclude by a preponderance of the evidence that a protected characteristic was at least a motivating factor. There was something that indicated, may even be circumstantial evidence that that was going on. So now we've completed all three of our methods of proof that we have in a discrimination case. And so now we're going to advance in our PowerPoint. So pause me as you uh, get to the slide that I'm about to show you. Here we go. Okay, so um, actually I don't have anything that I wanna say about this one. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about reasonable accommodation and exhaustion of administrative remedies. I care more about this second topic in this one. Uh, but let me just briefly touch on reasonable accommodation. The reason I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna kinda of dodge the bullet on reasonable accommodation is that we're gonna talk a lot about this in two later modules. So I'm just gonna kinda of touch on it a little bit and then we'll spend a few minutes talking about exhaustion of administrative remedies. So what is reasonable accommodation? Okay, when we see this term, I see there's two words. The first thing that I see is the word reasonable. We've already talked about the word reasonable. This word means objective. It's a, uh, if you see, whenever you see the reasonable in the legal context, always think objective standard. This is a standard that the court are gonna apply saying how would most people because the idea is most people are reasonable. How would the average disinterested party who's had the average life experience look at the situation? Would they look at it and go, yeah, that employer probably did enough? Or would they think, nah, nah I think the employer probably should have done a little bit more. So reasonable accommodation is in some sense a, a cultural evaluation, a circumstantial evaluation of situation. Um, so what are we looking to accommodate here? Well, the, it is the employer's duty under Title VII religious discrimination claims and under the Americans with Disabilities Act. An employer doesn't have the duty merely to avoid discriminating against people because of their religion and to avoid discriminating against people because of their disability. The employer has an additional burden under those two sections and that is to accommodate or to um, assist the worker with respect to his disability or with respect to his religious observance. Now, an employer is not required to reasonably accommodate beyond what's called the undue burden level. Now, even though the same language exists in the religious, the Title VII religious accommodation section as exists under the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
courts have interpreted the language very differently. So both talk about reasonable accommodation and both say that the upper limit is undue burden. The employer doesn't have to reasonably accommodate until it becomes an undue burden. So while the language is the same, the religious accommodation has been interpreted much more narrowly. Employers have to do significantly less to reasonably accommodate a religious uh, belief or practice of the employee than it does with respect to disability circumstances. Um, there's a lot of historical reasons for that and we'll talk more about that as we get to those sections, but just trust me about that one. Um, so, the, so even though the same language is used, the, dis, the, the obligation to reasonably accommodate disability is significantly more robust in the law. Okay, let's talk about exhaustion of administrative remedies. I want to talk a little bit more about this one because this one is one that um, we're not going to talk about or I mean it's, it's relevant to, to mo much of what we're going to discuss the rest of the semester but um, it's not something that um, this is kind of the moment to talk about it I guess you could say. There are certain statutes, Title VII uh, being one of them, that put certain responsibilities on the plaintiff. So let's say that I will, uh, let's say I am a uh, of um, Asian descent, and I feel that I was discriminated against because of my race. So I um, uh, decide I want to sue my employer. I've got wonderful facts. I don't want to go to the EOC. I want to go directly to the court system. So I go down to the federal court and I file my lawsuit. Well, my former employer is very likely to file a motion to dismiss at that point, saying, Your Honor, the plaintiff failed to exhaust her administrative remedies. This, the statute under which she's suing requires that she first file a charge of discrimination with the EOC and permit the EOC to investigate it. And that the plaintiff has the right to file her lawsuit only after the EOC has issued her a right to sue letter. And the court would agree with the former employer and would dismiss the lawsuit without prejudice because I still have the opportunity to file my charge of discrimination with the EOC, get my right to sue, and then turn around and file the lawsuit again. Uh, that's almost certainly how that would play out. Now, there isn't the requirement to exhaust every single, for every single statute, not all of them require this administrative remedy exhaustion, but it's a pretty common requirement in this area of the law. So you'll want to make sure if you are working with potential plaintiffs that you uh, may see if you need to fulfill this obligation. On the other hand, if you're working for employers, you want to make sure that anyone who files a lawsuit has exhausted his or her administrative remedies if there were the requirement under the statute. So let's consider a scenario here. Mary wants to file a charge of discrimination against her current employers. She consults her attorney and learns that she cannot directly file a case in court. She needs to first file with the EOC. Maybe she's filing it because of a Title VII claim, maybe sex discrimination. And again, this requirement is called exhaustion of administrative remedies. Let's consider what the remedies are available. I'm not going to do a tremendously deep dive here because um, I'm just kind of setting the stage, telling you the types of things that you might be able to get. And then we'll be a little bit more granular as we talk about particular statutes. Okay, so one thing that you can get is you can get reinstatement to one's position. I was fired and I sue and I'm successful. The jury says, yep, Groover, you are the victim of discrimination or retaliation or harassment, whatever the theory might be, and I can gain reinstatement to my position. Many times, though, the, the court will determine that reinstatement is inappropriate. Many times the employer doesn't want it. Many times the employee doesn't want it. Um, sometimes a better solution, because there's so much bad blood between the two, is for there to be some period of front pay instead of reinstatement. Um, another thing is back pay. From the time that I was terminated or not hired or not promoted or whatever, whenever the bad thing happened to me up until the date of trial, that would be the period of time that I would be eligible for back pay. Now, whatever pay I earned in the interim would be subtracted from that back pay. I'd only get the difference between those amounts. So, I, and I have the duty, of course, to mitigate my damages, to reduce my damages as much as I can. So let's say that I was earning $100,000 a year, and it was two years ago that I was let go. And in the interim, I had been employed earning $90,000 a year. 
well then I would have the difference between 100,000 minus 90,000 times two years, I would be eligible for $20,000 in back pay. Let's say instead though, I was earning $50,000 in my job and I was fired unlawfully and then I got another job where I earned $60,000. Well, I don't have any back pay then. I actually earn more money in my second job than I did my first job. There's also the opportunity for there to be some type of injunctive relief. An example of injunctive relief would be that the employer might be required to provide training to its workers you know, in order to stop the type of discriminatory behavior from recurring. The back pay is limited to two years from the filing of a charge with the EOC. Um, under the Title VII, you can get compensatory and punitive damages. Compensatory damages are kind of mental anguish type damages. Um, now, obviously, you can get your back pay and your front pay, so we're not talking about lost income here, but certainly the strain and stress of uh, being out of work or um, feeling uh, that you are underemployed in whatever position you're able to get can also cause significant harm to the plaintiff. And so that would be a way that the plaintiff could successfully uh, make that type of claim. Also, punitive damages are sometimes available under those circumstances. Um, the amount of punitive damages and compensatory damages that the uh, plaintiff might be eligible to collect is going to depend upon the size of the employer. The maximum is going to be $300,000 under Title VII, and that's both of those amounts combined. The jury is not told about those caps, and so the jury might well award significantly more than that, and then the judge will come back and order what's called a remitted or, or a reduction to the statutory limit. Um, juries, we do have a jury trial for most areas of the law, of employment discrimination law. The jury will usually be, be the decider of fact. Um, although certainly if both parties want to have the judge uh, conduct a bench trial, that is also permitted. Attorney's fees are eligible for successful plaintiffs. Uh, the usual rule, it's called the American rule. The usual rule in the United States is that the, um, uh, both sides pay their own bills. Uh, so if I uh, have a car accident and I want to sue Bob because I think he caused the car accident, and we go into the trial and I win, well, um, I get whatever judgment I get, but I have to pay my own legal bills and Bob has to pay his own legal bills. Now, my first example, I won, um, but even if I had lost, if Bob had won, Bob has to pay his legal bills, I have to pay my legal bills. Um, other countries, most notably England, has the opposite rule. It's the loser pays both rule. Um, whoever wins, uh, not only gets the, the award of whatever that might be, but also um, gets his or her legal bills paid. So the loser has to pay the loser's legal bills and the winner's legal bills. And if the loser is the defendant, then the loser has to pay whatever the judgment is. That's how the English system works. What we have in employment law is typically a hybrid of the American rule and the English rule. So let me give an example. Plaintiff wins, plaintiff being the former employer, former employee, I'm sorry. So the former employee wins, the former employee gets whatever, you know, front pay, back pay, whatever the amount of judgment is, and the employer, the defendant, has to pay the employee's legal bills. So that's like the English rule. But let's imagine a situation in which the employer wins. The employee, the plaintiff, was not able to persuade the jury that the employee's uh, case merited uh, a victory for the employee. So the uh, employee is not going to be awarded anything and the employee has to pay his own legal bills, but the employee does not have to pay the employers. So that's like the American rule. So you can see under both scenarios, the employer always has to pay its own legal bills. Whether the employee has to pay its own legal bills is going to depend upon whether the employee wins or loses. Then we have something called court costs. I thought I had a separate slide on that. Maybe I don't. Uh, court costs are, oh, I think I do. Let's just see if I do going forward. Uh, 
Ah, here we go. Court costs are out-of-pocket expenses incurred by a party during the course of legal proceedings. It's things like this. Uh, they're usually m much, much smaller than uh, the attorney's fees. Uh, not unusually, they might be in the ten to twenty thousand dollar range. Uh, so they aren't as significant as some of the other expenses that we see. I'm going to talk briefly about the Civil Rights Act. That's what it stands for here, Civil Rights Act of, of 1866. You might think to yourself, gosh, we've got a law from um, over 100 years that's relevant today. That seems rather surprising. Um, it, has, it is a law that has been revised, and it was revised in 1991. And people usually don't call it the Civil Rights Act of 1866. They call it Section 1981. Now, this mention of 1981 has something to do with the year. It's just it, the, the section of the statute. There's a section 1980 immediately before it and a section 1982 immediately after it. This statute provides lots of good uh, benefits for uh, plaintiffs in many discrimination cases and there are lots of advantages um, to uh, plaintiffs who happen to choose to sue under usually Title VII as well as this as well. The big benefit, one of the big benefits, not the only benefit, and we'll talk more about these when we get to the race discrimination presentation, but the big benefit is that there are no caps to the damages. Remember I said before, under this theory, that the most that the plaintiff can get for compensatory and punitive combined would be 300,000. Well, under Section 1981, it could in theory be millions of dollars. So uh, as smart uh, plaintiff's attorneys are going to sue under Title VII and the Civil Rights Act of 1980, uh, 19, excuse me, 1866 um, so that they can uh, set up their client to get more damages potentially. Here are the remedies available under the Equal Pay Act uh, and here are the damage, they're the remedies available under the Amer uh, uh, ADEA, the American, excuse me, Age Discrimination and Employment Act. I want to point out here the idea of liquidated damages. Liquidated damages um, arise in lots of different contexts in the law. So I'm going to def describe what it is, but I don't want you to think that this is what this term is always referring to in the law because there's lots of times where it's really referring to something different. But in this context, what happens is um, a plaintiff say, su is su successfully persuades the jury that it was a victim of, or she or he was a victim of age discrimination. And also persuades the jury that there was a willful violation of the law. In other words, the, the employer wasn't being just careless, but intended to discriminate based upon age discrimination. In that situation, then the a plaintiff doesn't just get the back pay and the front pay, but gets that amount one more time, gets it doubled. And that, that doubling is a liquidated damages. Um, so this becomes like punitive damages or compensatory damages, but there is no need for the plaintiff to actually prove compensatory damages. Um, this is kind of a, a built-in equation. Now, not every single victory under the Age Discrimination Employment Act will result in liquidated damages because, again, that of that willfulness requirement, but it's just one of the, the things to consider. I've already talked about jury co uh, court costs. Here's kind of a nice picture that goes through the, the most important of the um, categories. Uh, seniority, retroactive seniority, those are other things that can happen if a person has been laid off, perhaps from a union position where uh, your seniority can affect, you know, jobs you can post into or things along those lines. Well, if you've had a break of, of some period of time, you don't want to restart your seniority clock. And so the, uh, the a court can award uh, that seniority to the person. Here's a couple of terms, I guess one term we want to focus on, this is back pay. And here's our definition, money awarded for time employee was not working because of illegal discrimination. Keep in mind, the employee has the obligation to mitigate or to reduce the damages by seeking reasonable employment during that period of time. And we've already talked about these terms. 
uh, an unlawfully discriminating employer may be liable for back pay for up to two years before the filing of the charge of discrimination. Also for a reinstatement of the employee to his or her position, for retroactive seniority, for injunctive relief if applicable, and for attorney's fees. So this is kind of a nice summary of the differing things that the, employee, the employer might be on the hook for. Um, an unlawfully discrimination discriminating employer may be liable for uh, front pay for situations where reinstatement is not possible, actually will be liable for it under those circumstances. If, of course, the um, employee hasn't been able to attain similar employment. So let's consider a scenario to kind of make this really clear. Mary was employed as an associate manager in the purchasing department. Prior to her new supervisor coming on board, she had great appraisals, but her new boss is overheard saying women aren't smart enough to manage a department. She's fired for poor performance just six months later. Let's assume she wins her discrimination claim, and she would, of course, under those circumstances, be entitled to back pay and reinstatement. And again, it's possible the court might say, well, you know what, Mary's relationship with Badger Industries has been so soured by this litigation, front pay may be more appropriate than reinstatement. So here's just some management tips to uh, think about. Um, obviously, most of the time, uh, employment relationships don't result in litigation. That's a pretty unusual circumstance. But as an HR person or as a paralegal, you are going to see cases that do involve this. It's not always the ones that you expect, though. In my experience as an HR attorney, there were many times that we were sure Bob or Sally was going to sue us. I mean, we just knew it was going to happen, and it didn't. There were other times we had no idea something was going to happen, and it happened. So um, it, it's easy to think that we have more data than we actually do. And as a result, we ought to treat all uh, employees with the assumption that there is the possibility of a lawsuit. And so um, if, if we're aware of that, then that will help us uh, make sure that we've dotted every I and crossed every T. As I said before, even when the employer wins, the employer really doesn't win because the employer faces a huge legal bill. It's not at all unusual for these cases to be a six-figure investment for the employer, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And again, even if the employer is completely successful, there's no refund for the employer for that sum of money. Uh, depending upon the employer situation, usually insurance is not going to cover that. There are some categories of insurance that can cover certain claims, but uh, many times they don't apply, and many employers don't happen to cover those particular types. So instead of litigating the cases, you ideally want to prevent those cases from happening. Um, sometimes people think, well, this means that I, I, I shouldn't always hire the best and retain the best. Um, as long as when you say the best, you mean the best irrespective of race, religion, gender, uh, you would be mistaken. In fact, the, the smartest thing that you can do as an employer is have the best because uh, you absolutely can discriminate based upon the quality of the work output. But you also want to challenge yourself. Do I think that person is best because he or she is best? Or do I think that person is best because he or she looks like me and does the job in the way I would do the job? And so therefore, I think that that person is best. And again, you always have to be aware of the possibility of retaliation. Uh, some retaliation is intentional, but a lot of it isn't. People, uh, when they have been uh, criticized, uh, many times will will look upon that person who criticized them in a less positive light. They may not even be fully aware of it. Um, so it's impossible, I mean, excuse me, it's, it's important to monitor that, especially when you've had a whistleblower or somebody who's claimed uh, some type of, of complaint like that, uh, that you periodically go back and touch base with that person. Everything going okay? Uh, is there anything you want to talk about? That type of thing. And of course, you're going to want to document those conversations uh, with that particular employee so you can say, well, you know, I touched base with them six months after that incident. They said everything was fine. Um, and then if they file a lawsuit six months later, well, you know, that they, they, they're going to have a difficulty because they had that perfect opportunity to complain to you and yet they didn't. So uh, uh, 
one of the things that the HR person is uh, supposed to be doing is documenting the behavior, addressing problems when they arise, but also documenting when there aren't problems or there aren't evidences, evidence of problems. Because employment decisions, or decisions can have consequences months or years after the event, you know, ought to carefully document decisions, carefully document conversations that you have, and talk about why they happen and document with the, with the date and have a, some type of record. You're not going to remember three years from now what happened in this particular situation. And so it really does require keeping some kind of record and having that record available so you can re, uh, uh, refer to it, um, have it organized in a way that's, that's meaningful for you and is sufficiently detailed so you can uh, reconstruct the dynamics in that particular conversation. And when we're completed with module two, I hope this presentation has been helpful for you. It's been a pleasure presenting it to you. Um, of course, as always, if you have questions, feel free to email them to me or come by my office hours. I'll be delighted to talk with you at great length about these topics, anything that you would like to chat about. I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.